Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Stephanie Black. Uh, she's the medical director with the Communicable Disease Program in the, universe, in the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, and she's here tonight to provide us an overview of the COVID vaccine rollout. And to answer your questions, we will be providing our office's contact information and any links referenced within the presentation at the end of this town hall. Uh, Dr. Black's presentation will include the pre-submitted questions that many of you provided uh, during registration. And if time allows, we'll also take live questions from the Q&A box. Dr. Black, take it away. All right, let's see. Um, <laughs> hi everyone. I am not seeing my slides, so I just, I'm not sure you are either. Let's see. So can I just confirm that folks are seeing the full white screen or are you seeing a split screen with two slides? I'm seeing a split screen with two slides. Okay. So let me do this. Perfect. That's the full. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Alderman Kappelman, for the invita invitation to speak to everyone um, and for the great questions that were submitted in advance. So what I've uh, done is I've weaved those questions in throughout some informational um, slides that I had put together. Um, so um, hopefully many of your questions will be answered, but I'm certainly happy to take them um, at the end of this presentation as well. Um, so um, overall, I just wanted to set up a little bit about what's going on with coronavirus. Um, um, there were at least uh, 1,800 new coronavirus deaths and 129,000 more than that new cases that were reported across the United States. Um, just a couple days ago. But um, over the past week, there has been a decrease of 33% from the average of two, two weeks uh, prior to that. Um, but we are at more than 25 million people in the United States um, diagnosed with coronavirus. In Illinois, uh, there were at least 35 new coronavirus deaths and over 3,100 new cases reported just two days ago. But similarly, there has been a decrease too in Illinois of 33% um, over uh, the average uh, compared to two weeks earlier. So that is good. And um, let's see, on the next slide, I have some local data. And hopefully you've had a chance to explore our city of Chicago a coronavirus um, website. It will be helpful in terms of uh, vaccine information, but in terms of what's going on uh, with um, the pandemic, um, there are numbers here. And this was um, actually from a couple of days ago when I screenshot this, but we're down to like 6.6% positivity overall in the city, which is the number of tests positive out of all of the tests done. Um, and we were up at 16% um, in December. So this is a, a, an improvement, even though it's a little bit up in red um, relative to, to the days prior. Um, we are also seeing less uh, confirmed new cases a day. Um, this was up as high as 3,000 in December. Um, so these numbers are looking um, better, and that's reflected in these kind of epi curves that you see. So these are the number of cases um, per day. And you can see that um, coming down from this peak that we had in November. So that's good news. And further, I will say that um, these are shot, screenshots of, um, uh, let's see, 60640 here and 60613 um, just below it. Um, and we are, I can say we, because I live in 60613, um, <laughs> that the po percent positivity in the area, in, in um, our community areas here, our zip codes is good. Um, so we are doing well. Um, uh, these black bars show the um, 
overall city rate and the blue bars are um, this zip code in particular. So, you know, you can play around with this to kind of see what is going on um, in terms of, of activity in the zip code where you live. So um, just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, so I just wanted to start out talking about vaccine um, basics, that there are currently two COVID vaccines right now that have received emergency use authorization from the FDA. Um, as you well know, the, bio, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines, these are both mRNA or messenger RNA vaccines. And um, they um, work through this spike protein. And I'm going to show you a very, very brief video uh, that our commissioner put together, which I think is the most elegant, simple kind of rendition of how these vaccines work, which was question number one. Um, I, I do want to point out that neither vaccine is able to give you COVID-19. These vaccines are not like um, other vaccines, like the flu vaccine. It's not sort of an attenuated or altered virus. Um, these vaccines are... Um, a, a completely, you know, um, made in a lab. Um, they're just a very tiny piece of, um, of RNA. So you'll see about that in this video. Um, and also um, the vaccines are safe and highly effective, upwards of 94, 95% vaccine um, efficacy. And they're also being offered at no cost to the vaccine recipient. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm going to take us, I'm going to try to do this, take us to this video that I wanted to show you about how the vaccines work. Um, okay. And I did not receive, see that share sound um, option come up. So I'm not sure that Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. We're filming a short series of videos to give you more information about the science behind COVID vaccines. And we're starting today with how the first two COVID-19 vaccines work. You might have heard both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are what are called mRNA vaccines. That stands for messenger RNA. And RNA is genetic material that is a recipe or a set of instructions to teach a cell how to make proteins. So the way this works is the vaccine is injected into your arm and goes into your muscle cell, for example, and this message, this instructions, never go into the nucleus of your cell. That's where your DNA is. It only goes into what's called the ribosome, the part of the cell that makes proteins. That is always the job of your cell. But in this case, the vaccine teaches your cell to make the protein that is a little piece of the spike on the coronavirus itself. So coronavirus is sometimes, uh, it's known as the crown virus because it has spikes that make it look like a crown. And if we can teach the immune system to recognize the crown or the spikes, the next time you encounter COVID after you've been vaccinated, your body sees those spikes and it knows this is an intruder. Let me fight against COVID without ever making you sick. So you're protected because your immune system has learned from this message how to fight COVID without needing to make you sick. Dr. Tom Frieden, the prior head of the CDC, had a nice analogy here. He said, think of the messenger RNA as an email that is sent to your immune system with a picture teaching it how to fight COVID. And then the really cool part is that, that that email message acts like a Snapchat. It just disappears. The mRNA vaccine does not stay in your cells, does not stay um, in your nucleus. All its job is, is to have your cell make some of these spike proteins and teach your immune system to protect you. So it is impossible for you to get 
COVID-19 from the COVID vaccine because unlike some other vaccines that use killed other viruses, inactivated viruses, parts of viruses, this one has no virus at all. Just instructions teaching your body how to protect you against COVID. We will come back with more videos helping teach you about the science behind COVID vaccines. Thanks for tuning in. And now we have to figure out how to get back to my slides. Okay, I'm gonna try. Um. Dr. Black, I think if you hit the minimize feature of the video, it oh. should bring you back to the main screen so you can get out of it. Okay, let me see if that works, thank you the minimize portion. Is that yeah. there and then there? Okay, good teaching. <laughs> uh, thank you to the technically challenged here. Okay. As was pointed out, I'm not millennial. Okay, so anyway, those are a great series of videos. I encourage you to check those out as well. Um, but that's really the best, most simple, elegant explanation of how the vaccine works um, that I've, I've really heard. Um, okay. And we advance. Okay. Um, and so some of this is a reiteration then of, of, of what you just heard. So the mRNA vaccines teach our cells how to make this harmless piece of spike protein for SARS-CoV-2. And then after that pro protein piece is made, the R mRNA just disintegrates actually. Um, and then the cells display the spike protein on their surface and generate an immune response. And those, that fever that some people develop or muscle aches is actually your body developing those antibodies that end up protecting you. Um, so they're actually kind of a good sign uh, to see. Um, and once again, so the mRNA vaccines do not use live virus that cause COVID. So there's no way they can actually give you COVID. Um, and they do not interact with our DNA in any way. They don't enter the cell nucleus. Okay, so in terms of this emergency use authorization process, it is accelerated during a public health emergency um, with the collaboration of many scientists that actually bring to fruition um, research that had been going on for a long time. And I wanna share that the mRNA vaccine has actually, um, that platform has been used in developing vaccines for HIV, for rabies, um, for Zika virus, and even uh, influenza um, have been in clinical trials. There were some there were, I, I think the science had to be, how do we package this little, you know, um, little fragment of, of RNA um, to be able to get into the body. Um, and that science was really um, a miracle of, of what has taken place over the last year. So what normally takes, you know, on, on like 10 years to go through the whole um, process of development and then, um, clinical trials and regulatory review and approval was compressed in time. Um, but no feature of that usual process was uh, forgone. Like everything was included. Um, and so we are confident in the safety and efficacy of this vaccine. Um, the long-term safety monitoring does um, uh, continue and I'll go through that just a little bit. So um, again, the two vaccines that are available um, went through these what's called phase three clinical trials. So large clinical trials where people either received the vaccine or a placebo. Um, and you can see the numbers here on the screen, but very highly effective across um, all ages, genders, um, and racial and ethnic groups. They do both require two doses. The Pfizer vaccine is three weeks apart between dose one and dose two, and for Moderna, uh, that is a full month apart. They also have both require um, uh, freezer 
uh, temperatures, but the Pfizer, I'm sure if you, uh, many of you have heard, is actually even uh, ultra cold and um, really needs a special um, preservation. And so this has in part um, been a complexity of the distribution of vaccine because you know you obviously need certain storage capacity to be able to hold the vaccine in order to administer it. So um, a little bit more about um, questions that followed around kind of how the vaccine uh, works. So um, I think we talked a little bit about how, you know, how the vaccine works to protect people from contracting the virus. It teaches your immune system to generate that spike protein um, and then antibodies um, against the COVID uh, virus. So if you encounter it, you can fight it off. So in what time frame is the vaccine supposed to give me immunity? Generally speaking, it um, in the Pfizer vaccine showed that high rate of efficacy uh, at one week after the second dose. For Moderna, they checked um, that efficacy at two weeks after the second dose. Um, in terms of the duration of immunity, um, that is what is still uh, under study. So, you know, will you need a booster at some point? That remains to be seen. Um, but for now, in terms of when you are initially immune, you have to get do both doses of the vaccine and it should be one to two weeks after that, um, that you should have an adequate immune response. So um, another question, should everyone get the vaccine uh, even if they don't have underlying conditions? And the answer is, well, yes, unless you have a contraindication or for now, studies are still trials, clinical trials are ongoing in terms of um, administration to children. Um, there's currently Moderna vaccine is being looked at in um, ages 12 to 17. The Pfizer vaccine is able to be given um, down to age uh, 16. But you do not, the answer to that question is you do not have to have an underlying condition um, uh, to, to eventually get the vaccine. Um, maybe I'll use this as the first time to tell folks that we are asking for patients. It, we are not currently receiving enough vaccine for the population that wants it and really um, those most vulnerable who need it right away. Um, so I'll say it for the first time now that, that um, eligibility does not mean uh, accessibility at this point. Um, but more to come on that, uh, we'll talk more about this, this whole rollout in that process. So should you get vaccine if you've already had COVID-19? And the answer to that is yes. It does look like the amount of antibody that's generated by vaccination is actually even higher than um, what is um, developed um, by natural immunity and by having the infection itself. Um, and so it is recommended that you get the vaccine uh, even if you've already had COVID. Um, and, and I think that too speaks to um, this issue of the durability of your immune response. Okay, another question, is it safe to get other vaccines such as the flu shot at the same time as the COVID-19 vaccine? The CDC recommends now that other vaccines should be separated uh, from receipt of the COVID-19 vaccine by at least 14 days. So if possible, um, please do try to separate getting vaccine of another type um, within the two weeks of when you're due to get your vaccine for COVID. Okay, more questions. Does the vaccine also protect people from spreading the virus to others? Can you spread COVID between the first and second dose? So it's currently unknown whether vaccinated individuals are still able to have asymptomatic disease and transmit the virus. So what the vaccine does that, that the clinical trials showed was that the vaccine will prevent symptomatic illness and subsequent hospitalization. 
Um, but in order to assess for asymptomatic carriage, the vaccine recipients had to be tested. And in fact, for Moderna, they were tested and the initial data suggests that those who received vaccine were much less likely, um, like two thirds less likely to have virus present when they were checked right before their second dose. But the big number, the numbers um, are yet to really be published. There's just some preliminary data suggesting that, you know, the outlook is good, but we don't have the full answer yet. So the bottom line is that the vaccines prevent symptomatic disease. We, we have a sense, but we don't know for certain that they prevent asymptomatic carriage. And that's the reason that we're asking people, even if you've had vaccine, to continue to maintain six feet of social distancing and wearing a mask, uh, et cetera. Um, and then the question about, can you spread COVID between the first and second dose? So you are not fully immune, as I initially said, until a couple of weeks, a week or two after the second dose. Um, one dose of vaccine for Pfizer is about is estimated to be about 50 to 53 percent um, effective. Um, but so the point is to keep uh, using these preventative measures um, between vaccine uh, and also um, after you've had the second dose. So what happens if someone has an allergic reaction to the vaccine? So that depends on what type of reaction um, people are having. Um, you will be asked about any sort of um, prior um, allergic reactions to medicines. Um, individuals who have um, allergies to injectable uh, uh, antibiotics um, will be asked to wait um, 30 minutes after they receive their vaccine. Um, and also anybody who's had a history of anaphylaxis to anything else um, like bee stings, um, um, things like that, that those individuals do need to wait 30 minutes after they've been vaccinated and just be monitored. Um, but um, they, that is not a contraindication to vaccine. Um, the only contraindication is really is having um, an allergic reaction um, to the COVID vaccine, a severe allergic reaction to the COVID vaccine uh, in the first place or to any of the um, ingredients. Um, and I have a list of those uh, later on in the slide deck. Um, but um, PEG is one of them and polysorbate is another um, um, a component of that vaccine. So uh, question, do I have a choice in which vaccine I can receive? Um, the, in terms of between the two um, vaccines, um, probably, probably not. Um, it will depend on where you end up getting vaccinated and the type of storage capacity that they have. Of course, if you have a serious allergic reaction to the first dose of vaccine, then um, you will be referred to see an immunologist to assess about both the environment in which you might receive the second dose, but you, you probably, that would be, as I mentioned, a contraindication, and it would likely be that you would not receive any further doses of um, these first two mRNA vaccines, but rather um, have a vaccine down the line, um, those vaccines that are in development now that are a totally different um, mechanism of action. Okay, how can I learn more about the vaccination and receive updates? So I put this um, website here. Um, there is lots of information on the city uh, website. Um, COVID-19 um, vaccine, um, both for healthcare providers, employers, members of the public, and there's also um, statistical data about um, the vaccine rollout and who's been vaccinated and, and whatnot. Um, a question came through about what if I do not have internet access? Is there a phone number I can call to receive this information? Um, and the answer is um, yes, there is a phone number. Um, and when you call this number, you will reach our um, kind of public health emergency line, which is 311. And so you would have to indicate to them 
um, uh, uh, that you are interested um, in uh, information about um, getting vaccinated. Um, and so this would be the number to call. Um, but you can also, if you do have internet, can register at um, Shy COVID Coach. Um, that at that uh, at that site, you will be able to enter um, your eligibility, what group you would be in, and how um, you can be contacted. But I I do, uh, and we will talk about this more in future slides. Um, advise that you need to advocate for yourself in terms of, of getting vaccine. But this is the way for you to let the city know that you are interested in receiving vaccine through this shy COVID coach. So that's how you sign up in the city of Chicago um, to say, hey, I want the COVID vaccine. Um, and then um, we will find a way for you to get it. Okay. So um, I was mentioning these common side effects of the vaccine are swelling and pain at the injection site. And um, I did, I received the Pfizer vaccine because I go into nursing homes and see patients sometimes. Um, and it, it did cause, I had a pain at the site and I did have a headache the next day that totally went away with Excedrin. And by the next, the day after that, I felt fine, back to normal. I also did have some muscle, uh, some some muscle aches, um, but I was happy about it because that meant that my immune response was um, was in gear. Um, and side effects are mild. Um, they're actually usually seen in a younger age group um, compared to older. Um, and I know that's a dicey definition, but um, you know individuals over uh, sixty. Uh, five or so um, were, had less um, uh, systemic sort of um, side effects okay. than those younger, I should say. Okay, in terms of monitoring side effects, um, there, are, there is this really easy system um, that actually when you get vaccinated, you'll um, be shown how you can sign up for this vSafe. Um, and also, again, I signed up. It's really super easy. You get pinged um, once a day just to check in. And it's kind of nice. It's a, like a little bot, you know, checking in on you. And um, if um, you you make any notation about uh, a concern um, outside of what would be expected, um, CDC will reach out to you. Um, so this is a great mechanism by which um, people are tracked for side effects and a way of sort of tabulating more data um, even after the clinical trial about um, side effects. I guess I didn't also mention there's another system called this vaccine adverse event reporting system, which is um, a site where either you or your provider can um, also provide more detailed information about um, any, uh, any kind of um, uh, side effect that you're concerned about um, after you take the vaccine. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, in order for that full efficacy, um, both vaccines require two doses. Um, at our pod sites, we have these nifty stickers that you can get. Um, and then um, again, to reach that 95% uh, vaccine um, efficacy, we do, you do need the two doses. And also important for durability, at least in other vaccines, durability of the immune response. Uh, it's worth mentioning too that the COVID mRNA vaccines will not cause you to test positive on uh, the PCR viral tests or the antigen tests. So if you end up testing positive after you get the vaccine, um, then you need to be in touch with your provider and um, likely isolate. Um, and as mentioned, um, people who have previously been diagnosed um, with COVID-19 or SARS coronavirus 2, um, there is still benefit um, from vaccination. And in terms of the timing of that, if you get a first dose of vaccine and then you end up developing COVID illness, the um, ask is that you would isolate, you would sort of keep to yourself then for that period of 10 days, you would of course seek 
medical attention if you were short of breath or having um, more symptoms. Um, but um, after that 10 day period is when you could seek your um, next dose as appropriate, the, the appropriate interval, either the three weeks for Pfizer, four weeks for Moderna, um, you could get that next dose. Um, but also um, if you have had uh, COVID, it is thought that you have some sort of immunity for a period of 90 days after. So you can also wait a little bit longer. That's something you can talk about with your uh, medical provider. Okay, what to expect before, during, and after the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and so before, and we're gonna talk about this, is, is seeing where you are eligible, when you're eligible for the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. Um, when you're getting your vaccine, you'll get the um, fact sheet that tells you a little bit about um, what side, side effects you might experience or might not. Um, and then you will receive uh, a card um, that indicates that you've been vaccinated. Um, and then afterward, again, you will uh, have the opportunity to make your second dose appointment. Um, and then we do ask that you enroll in that VSAFE program. Um, and then, like I mentioned, it's really important to keep using the protective measures um, even after you've had the, both doses of the vaccine. Okay. Um, again, it's really important that um, you still have to be vigilant um, even after getting vaccinated um, about um, masking and social distancing. Um, and so again, um, cleaning, disinfecting your hands, um, alcohol-based hand rub, if they're not you know, obviously um, contaminated or grossly dirty, um, if they are, then you need to use soap and water. Um, I think we've covered this, so I'll keep going. Okay, what about the vaccine distribution? So these are the various phases of the vaccination rollout in Chicago. So as you know, like we know that in mid-December, we started with vaccination of those most vulnerable. So in our uh, long-term care facilities, um, both residents and healthcare workers, um, that vaccination process is still underway and is happening largely through a pharmacy program. Um, where vaccine is being brought to individuals in those facilities. And then the other major um, outreach was through uh, hospitals um, to reach healthcare workers and all of their um, affiliated um, parts. So um, outpatient providers that work through that hospital, um, all healthcare workers, and that is broad, broadly reaching uh, dentists, physical therapists, um, uh, people who take care of, of people in a clinical setting um, were included in phase 1A. Um, in phase 1B, um, which just formally started just yesterday, um, and I will mention there are some 400,000 healthcare workers in Chicago, so that process is still underway. And you can see that this um, picture is, is a little bit sloped at the top. And that is because phase, phase 1A is continuing even as we start phase 1B. And so in terms of the sum of people who make up this category, phase 1B, it's about 600,000 people. And we are getting about 32,000 to 34,000 doses of vaccine a week. That means we can vaccinate about five to 10% of people who uh, require vaccine in this category each week. So it's going to take us a couple of months to get through the 1B group. Um, and so once again, this is the second time I think I will be asking for your patience in this um, presentation. And so, um, uh, I'll get more into detail about what we mean by frontline essential workers, um, but this also will include anyone over the age of 65 and then also non-residential healthcare settings. So we are making a very concerted effort to 
um, vaccinate um, congregant settings. So areas where people are, are living together and then people who work there can then come in contact with COVID and spread it into their communities. So uh, as a public health department, we feel very strongly that, that even vaccinating those in congregant settings will actually help the rest of the Chicago area. And I'm talking about shelters, I'm talking about corrections facilities um, and, and, and non-healthcare residential settings. And so you can see the timeline on the rest of the slide for phase uh, 1C, which are remaining essential workers, and I'll get into that in more detail. And then those who are uh, age 16 to 64 who have underlying medical conditions. And then the vaccine will open up to all Chico Chicagoans age 16 and older. Um, and that number may drop as clinical trials become available for, for younger sets. Okay, I know I need to maybe move along so we can get to... Um, so this, this slide gets a little bit more in depth about who makes up um, each of these categories. I mean, I've kind of talked through already um, this 1A group about um, the long-term care facilities and healthcare workers, non-hospital based docs, but let's get into 1B, which I know many people have um, concerns about. So there are more than 300,000 people in just this group of 65 and older. And then there's about 360,000 people who are in this frontline essential workers. And so these are the groups of essential workers um, who are prioritized to 1B. So corrections workers, first responders, grocery store workers, um, this, might this would include food pantry folks. This is people who produce or sell, sell food um, for others. Um, also um, manufacturing and factory settings um, that have had outbreaks, because again, this is where we see our vulnerable population, people working in these settings who can then take COVID back to their communities. So we think important to vaccinate that group. Um, daycare workers, educators who are in the K through 12 um, and early education worker, um, grades, um, public transit, um, agriculture workers, and then postal workers, and some aspects of government are included here too. There is um, also then um, the, the other, all other essential workers would fall in the 1C group. And that um, for the time frame is going to be most likely April and May um, for the 1C group. Okay. Um, here, once again, is to give you kind of a sense of the numbers um, in terms of how many people are, are in each of these kind of 1B um, categories and examples of, of who we're talking about. Um, and I'll give you a second to, to look this over a little bit. Um, but I, I again, point to this huge um, number of people and think about this relative to the amount of vaccine right now that we're getting. And we do think that the amount of vaccine that we're getting is probably not likely to increase for a, a few weeks, um, despite the new administration's effort to you know, push that forward. It's going to take a little bit of time to get more vaccine um, rolled out to us. And I think all major metropolitan areas are having this problem. Like we're ready, we have, we have, we have the sites ready to vaccinate. It's just, we don't have enough vaccine for all of the people who want it um, right now. Okay, this is kind of one more slide with um, some of that same information on here. So I'm gonna keep going because I, I do wanna leave us some time or questions. Um, okay, more, qu more questions that came through um, before um, uh, from folks in the ward. So what do I need to do to make sure that I can get the vaccine as soon as I am eligible? So we incur are encouraging people to try to get their vaccine um, from the places they usually go to get their flu shot. Um, so we do recommend your doctor's office. I fully will agree that 
not every doctor's office has vaccine yet. Um, I will show you a map soon that, uh, that um, has some sites, um, but in all likelihood, if your provider is at a major academic center, they are more likely to have vaccine because that's where vaccine first rolled out. But every acute care hospital in Chicago did receive vaccine. So it's just how close your, pri your primary care provider is to linking to that hospital supply, um, whether they have it at this point. Um, we have had about 400 people sign up to receive vaccine to be able to give it out. The problem, once again, is just that we don't have that much vaccine to put it out into all of those that are willing to even give it. Um, but do let your doctor know that you're, you're interested, you want to receive vaccine. I think that is a good first call to make in addition to signing up to that shy uh, COVID coach. Those are two areas to look at. There will be pharmacies um, and also like Jewel Osco and Mariano's, some, some grocery stores that will be offering um, vaccine. Um, and also people will be able to get vaccinated potentially through your employer. We are encouraging um, uh, locations that have more than 250 employees to actually set up um, with a third party to perform vaccination at that work site. If people have less than 250 employees, um, then it's the, those um, type of uh, uh, workplaces will be able to get um, potentially um, vaccinated at our city um, point of distribution. And that's what POD stands for when we talk about city pods. Um, and um, so those are the major ways that um, vaccine is being made available. Okay, what determines who is in each phase and how, I can, how can I prove that I belong in the current phase? So we did kind of go through that. Um, you know, I'd like to say you'll be called by your physician to come in to get vaccinated. But I think this is a situation where you'll, you should call, if you're over 65, you should reach out to your provider. Um, and, and if you don't have one, um, we can assist with that. There are federally qualified healthcare centers also that will be receiving vaccine where you can get vaccine free of charge. Um, in terms of being an essential worker, um, you should be set up through your employer. Um, and so we're counting on the employers to kind of validate um, people's identity, if you will. Um, we appreciate this is a limited commodity, um, but also don't want to set up barriers for people to get the vaccine. So how does prioritization work within each phase and who determines that? Um, there is a team at CDPH who meet uh, every morning to talk about vaccine allocation. Um, but I talked about kind of the, the prioritization um, through the phases right now. We did sign an agreement upon receiving the vaccine um, initially that we would follow the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices or ASIP recommendations. And that is what we are doing. Um, if my job is essential, will my employer have to schedule the vaccine for me or can I register somewhere? So as, as mentioned, if, it's, if you're one of those essential workers that fall in 1B, your employer should be scheduling you. And I would encourage you to ask your employer about this. I mentioned the over and under 250 employee issue. Um, if less than 250, then likely vaccine will be um, provided through a city point of distribution um, center. Um, now, if you're over 65 and you're an essential worker, it doesn't hurt to let your doc know that you're interested in vaccine and just see what comes through first. My in-laws live in the suburbs. I told them to sign up at their physician's office and also to sign up with Lake County. That's what they're doing. Okay, um, are people living with someone with underlying conditions able to receive a vaccine in phase 1B? What if that person is also the primary caregiver in the home? And that's an excellent question. Um, these are all really good questions, but um, so 
that has been talked about and this is kind of the definition of what people have arrived at for those individuals because we can't vaccinate a whole household for that reason because we will don't just don't have enough vaccine but primary caregivers of medically fragile children or adults who live at home but require a level of ongoing care that's typically provided in a skilled nursing facility or rehab hospital will be able to get vaccine under the 1B eligibility. Okay, this is just to show this kind of concept that we will be overlapping the phases um, over you know, um, the next several months. Um, it will be a transition from one phase to the next, not an abrupt change. Um, in terms of the prioritization, I think that I have um, talked through this a bit. Um, we, we really are also looking at this kind of what is the burden of SARS in a given area. We're very um, conscious of you know, areas that have high percent positivity rates going out into the communities um, and, and really knocking on doors and helping to sign people up for vaccine. Um, so um, we are concerned about those hotspot areas in uh, Chicago um, and, and are setting up these strike teams to be able to go out and actually deliver vaccine in those areas. Um, at CDPH, we're very concerned about equity, have been before COVID, but as COVID has put in sharp relief, um, the structural racism that's present in our city um, has to be addressed and we are committed to doing this. Um, so in terms of this um, uh, diagram, um, so these are, um, the SEI is susceptible, exposed and infectious um, considerations. And I think what, what we're getting at here is that we are paying attention to those settings in which we know that there were outbreaks over the last um, year that many of my colleagues and myself have been working on. And so we want to get those individuals and those workplaces vaccinated so that they are not bringing COVID back into their communities. Okay, in terms of how organizations can get ready, um, that um, this is if you are a business um, or um, you have your own kind of human uh, or uh, employee health, um, that individuals who are going to distribute vaccine need to report that information into um, a, an electronic capture system called iCare. And so that's how we know who has been vaccinated and with which vaccine. So um, this first row really is speaking to those individuals who are interested in becoming vaccinators. Um, in terms of third party providers, um, this is if your organization um, is again, as large as 250 people that you may want to sign up with a third party provider. Those are also available. The, uh, there is a short list that is on our website um, if you um, look under vaccine uh, information, there's a tab specifically for employers um, where you can look to um, get information about those who may provide um, vaccination. And then also um, there will be city administration. And actually this survey that we're talking about is open now um, uh, and available through that employer site. Um, for people to sign up that they need to receive um, vaccine um, so that people get into this list of um, recipients. And um, here is a diagram of the ways in which the city vaccine supply will be distributed. So our um, city operated sites are gonna include these fixed points of distribution and I'll show you a map in, in just a moment. Um, public safety points of distribution. So the Chicago Fire Department is running um, one. There will be a mobile point of dispensing. So um, like vaccine sort of vans um, that we've had for years. Um, and then also these strike teams who will go in and vaccinate as needed. Um, and then the, the, the direct delivery um, to hospitals, pharmacies and providers 
who will then um, also um, provide um, outreach. And we realize that that's not as easy as this diagram might indicate. Okay, um, I think that this is the uh, last bit of the questions that came in beforehand. Um, where will I be able to get the vaccine? Do I have a choice between my doctor's office, a pharmacy or another location? Um, you do have a choice, yes, but I would sign up for whatever. It, this is a tight market. And again, I would sign up, let your physician know that you're interested in getting vaccinated or establish a relationship with a federally qualified healthcare center, give them a call um, if you don't have a provider now. Um, and then keeping eyes on pharmacies. Um, again, we'll let, have those sites available, but it's hard to get an appointment right now because they are being prioritized um, for you know, 1A and then the start of 1B groups. Where will the vaccine distribution sites be placed throughout the city? Again, I'll have a map that, um, the, and this map will be updated on our website. What's the cost of getting a vaccine? Even if the shot itself is free, will medical providers be able to charge for an appointment? You should be able to receive the vaccine free of any charge to you. There may be a, um, a, a administration fee that is billed to your insurance, but if you don't have insurance, you will not be charged. Let us know at the health department if you're being charged for anything. How can I receive the vaccination if it's not available through my employer or healthcare provider? So pharmacies will have vaccine available. It's just this short, you know, the limited availability right now um, or through these city um, points of dispensing, um, you will be able to get vaccinated. And then that's another time I'm gonna ask for your patience. I hope what you've heard through this talk is that it will take us at least two months to get through the 600,000 plus people in the 1B category. There will eventually be vaccine available for everyone who wants it. It's just going to take us, you know, months to get there. Okay. Um, here is the um, map that I referred to, and you can go to this um, link at the bottom is where you can find that map. And if you hover over the dots, you can see um, where it is and how many um, appointments are available. There's basically really not much available right now. I'm just going to tell you there's there's just not, not there's not really vaccine available. You will be you should reach out to your provider or your employer will contact you. Um, these are other locations I've mentioned where when vaccine when we have enough vaccine, we will get out to these other locations. So Walgreens, Mariano's, Walmart, um, Jewel Asco, um, pharmacies will be carrying vaccine um, when we get enough and we are waiting for that day. <laughs> okay, um, these are the um, fixed point of pods that are through city colleges. Um, again, we're mostly focusing on people who are employers who have less than 250 uh, employees. Um, uh, and, and also, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, ed educators may be going here, like daycares who don't have formal um, uh, relationships. Um, CPS is likely is going to be distributing their own um, to the to, to teachers. Um, when will we get the vaccine? We are not able to give specific timelines, but I, I did. I gave a rough timeline, um, and as mentioned, the vaccine su supplies are are limited um, right now. I think this is mostly um, again, you know, reaching out to your organization about if you're if you're running the organization about you know finding out how many people are interested in getting vaccine and thinking about um, prioritizing um, within your own, within your own uh, sector. You know, people who are able to work from home and sit by a computer maybe don't need to get, um, aren't at the top of the list. Whereas people who interact daily with um, the public are really, those are people who need to be prioritized. This is a picture of our commissioner getting her second dose of vaccine here. Okay. 
And then there's lots of tools available on our website to educate people about getting them interested in getting vaccinated. You can hang fact sheets and posters um, around um, to get people interested because the more people we get vaccinated, um, the sooner we can um, get through this. Um, and this has become even more important in light of these um, variant strains. COVID-19 vaccines, one of the most important tools we have to keep each other safe and get back to normal. All right, I will stop, stop talking um, since we have five minutes um, and, and see if there are additional questions, but I hope I hit on um, many of your questions. And, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Black. It looks like, uh, I mean, I, I have one quick question. It comes from someone. Um, are you guaranteed a second dose after receiving the first one? We are committed to providing um, the second dose. Um, we are not holding doses back. So we are reliant on that steady stream um, from the federal government. So um, you will receive a second dose. Um, CDC has extended the time period in which they are recommending, you know, the window is supposed to be three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Moderna. They are saying out to six weeks is okay. Um, UK is not giving everybody the second dose till everybody gets the first dose. We are not doing that. Um, we're really trying to stick as close to the clinical trials um, as, as we, we can. Um, so, you know, um, our intention is to provide a second dose to anybody who gets a first dose, um, but we are relying on the, the shipments from the federal government to get that vaccine. Okay, I think maybe one more question. Will patients with underlying medical conditions need a physician's note or other documentation to receive the vaccine in 1C? Or like, here's a, something that adds to this. If a person with diabetes, for instance, went to Walgreens, for example, would the pharmacy know from the prescriptions that this person's taken that it's legitimate for them to be in line with yeah. group 1C? Yeah, I mean, thank you. That's a good question. And they will be able to do that. I think we are also um, relying on people's good goodwill to follow through um, and get the vaccine when it's appropriate for them. Um, a very quick one. If you can't get an appointment for your second dose of Moderna on the 28th day, does that reduce the efficacy you get if you get it three or four days past the 28th day? No, it's just fine to get it um, past that date. It has actually with the intervals with vaccine, it's important to reach that minimum. But after that, it's okay. And CDC, like I just uh, said, is, 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 has said it's okay to go out until six weeks. Um, and if it has to be past that, it does, but. Okay. It's well, okay if it's a few days past the 28th. Okay, good. Well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Black, for joining us this evening and, and for everyone who's attended this. Uh, there'll be a video recording of this event. It'll be posted on my website, james46.org. If you have friends or colleagues who weren't able to attend this session, please encourage them to, to visit uh, my website to view this recording. Uh, so everyone have a good evening and make sure you wear your mask and stay safe. Thank you so much, Alderman Kappel. Then if, if you do wanna send me questions I didn't get to, I can try to answer those and send them back to your staff. Um, Perfect. Perfect. If, so if that's helpful, a, I'm sorry, I did go on a long, a long time. <laughs> so we do have a few more questions. So we'll we'll send those to you and then we'll put the answers on our website and a link to it in our newsletter. If you don't get the newsletter, just go to james46.org. You can sign up for the newsletter and then you'll have the answers to the questions. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Thank you. Bye, everyone.